What's poppin' ass kickers? It's me, MT, and welcome back to the Heavy Spoiler Show, y'all. This is going to be a breakdown of the kick-ass movie from 2010. One of my personal favorite comic book movies of all time, because it is just a crazy, wild ride of a comedy. So, without further ado, let's just jump into this damn thing. But, make sure you kick that like button's ass, too, because every like really helps out the channel. The movie starts with voices in the background saying the words, Guardian of the Universe protecting us against the forces of evil. He can catch a bullet, halt a speeding train, up in the sky, is it a bird, is it a plane? Very purposely evoking the surprise remarks of citizens at Superman in classic Superman media. Then we start off the movie by watching an Armenian man with a red-winged costume jump off of a building attempting to fly like the Marvel hero, the Falcon. But unfortunately, all he would end up doing is falling to his death onto the roof of a car. This opening is exactly the way the original kick-ass comic book by Mark Millar and John Romita Jr. starts off. Even the words of Dave's whole opening monologue is pretty much ripped straight from those opening pages. But in the comic book version, there were no pedestrians clapping at Flying Guy's bravery. In fact, they didn't even know that he was there until he decided to rudely ruin that innocently parked taxi with his body. Then after we get the title of the movie on the license plate of that taxi, we meet the protagonist of the movie, Dave Lezinski, who apparently attends Millard Fillmore High School, a high school named after the 13th president of the United States. The 80s TV show Head of the Class was also based on a high school with the same name, which is likely coincidental. And part of me actually thinks that they might have chosen this particular president as a nod to Kick-Ass co-creator Mark Millar, as the name Millard has Millar's name in it. However, although the name of the school sounds American as hell, the actual name of the school in real life is anything but, as the school scenes of the movie were filmed at the Sir Winston Churchill School in Ontario, Canada. And as Dave is walking through the school's hallways, the voiceover from his future self mentions that he's not a super popular guy with 3,000 friends on MySpace, with that MySpace reference being dated as hell. If you're not an old fossil like me, you probably don't know that MySpace was basically the original social media site that dominated the entire world before the Zuck decided to suck the fun out of all of social media with the rise of Facebook. And this isn't the first superhero movie to start off with a reference to MySpace, as Robert Downey Jr.'s first ever scene as Tony Stark in Iron Man 1 started with him referencing the popular social media site as well. But hey, speaking of the MCU, when Dave Dave goes to meet up with his nerdy comic book bros Marty and Todd, we can see that Todd is played by actor Evan Peters, who would famously end up playing Quicksilver in the Fox X-Men films shortly before Aaron Taylor Johnson would become the Quicksilver for the MCU. So it's super weird but ultra satisfying to see the both of them share the screen as comic book obsessed homies. And shortly after this, we get a moment of Dave checking out his English teacher Mrs. Zane's boobs instead of reading Hamlet, which is something comic book Dave does with his biology teacher, who was also named Mrs. Zane. And this moment in the movie is also kind of funny considering that Aaron Taylor Johnson is actually a big fan of older women in real life, with his current wife, Sam Taylor Johnson, being straight up 23 years older than he is. Which is kind of wild, especially since they first met when Sam would direct a teenaged Aaron in the movie Nowhere Boy, with Aaron basically proposing to her soon after that movie wrapped. So that whole relationship is kind of uh, suspicious as hell, but luckily for Sam, she seems to be on good terms with rapper Kendrick Lamar, so she will not be being exposed anytime soon. And later during this intro, Todd asks Dave if he's watching the cartoon Family Guy before we soon learn that Dave's mother Alice died of an aneurysm while the family was eating a knockoff brand of Honey Nut Cheerios called Whole Grain Honey Puffs. And while Dave is reflecting how the death of his mother wasn't very superhero-like, with him swearing to avenge her death over her grave like some sort of Batman, I noticed that that moment was cut straight from the comics as well. Then the movie brings us to Dave and his friends hanging out at Atomic Comics. And while Dave asks his friends why nobody's ever tried their hands at being a superhero, we can see a poster for Mike Mignola's Hellboy comics behind Todd and Marty while Marty reads Runaways Volume 2, issue number 28 by Joss Whedon. Marty's response of how being a superhero is impossible is also ripped straight out of issue one of Kick-Ass as well, along with Dave's statement on how everybody wants to be Paris Hilton, but nobody wants to be Spider-Man. But comic book Dave got laughed at by some girls at school for saying that line out loud. As he should, because that was, a uh, kind of super lame. And shortly after this, in comes Chris D'Amico, played by actor Christopher Mintz-Plasse. 
still riding his popularity following his appearance in the classic comedy Superbad during the time this movie came out. Actually, Christopher originally auditioned for the role of Kick-Ass before landing the role of Chris D'Amico, and honestly, I could totally see that dude playing a pretty good Kick-Ass in another universe. And we learn that Chris D'Amico is the son of the super wealthy gang boss, Frank D'Amico. In the comics, Chris actually has a different last name completely, with Chris being called Chris Genovese and his father being called John Genovese. However, because comic book writer Mark Millar based that family's name on a real-life mob family, the movie production decided to change the family's last name to D'Amico in order to avoid any potential problems with that gang. Matthew Vaughn simply did not want that kind of smoke. So John Genovese's name was changed completely to Frank D'Amico, played by the super talented Mark Strong. And while Chris is looking at comics, we can see a life-size Spider-Man statue in frame with a Scarface comic on the rack to the right of the frame. Scarface is something that the film repeatedly references, not only when Stu yells, say hello to my little friend at Hit Girl towards the end of the movie, but also when Big Daddy and Kickass are being beaten to death on D'Amico's livestream, as the background of that livestream is the same background that was used in Frank's execution scene in the Scarface movie. Frank D'Amico himself seems to also have been modeled closely after Tony Montana, in particular Tony's temper, as Frank is clearly not afraid to kill an op in broad daylight just like Tony Montana would. And after Dave is told to F off by Chris's bodyguard Stu, Dave and Todd leave Atomic Comics only to be immediately mugged by two thugs in the parking lot of an adult sexy time store. An event which inspires Dave to go online and buy some scuba gear in order for him to fashion his new superhero suit. Then we head to Frank's Lumber Supplies, where one of Frank's loyal guys are being tortured for a transgression that they didn't commit, while trying to explain to Frank's boys that the true person responsible for the loss of Frank's coke was some crazy mysterious crime-fighting vigilante dressed up like DC's Batman, which of course inspired much of Big Daddy's design in the movie as comic book Big Daddy looks nothing like Batman. Then, after Trey gets his fingers chopped off and his life taken away, Frank then takes his son Chris to the same movie theater that we see Dave, Todd, and Marty walking out of. And at the marquee at the top of the theater, we can see that the theater is playing The Spirit 3, which is a reference to Frank Miller's god-awful 2008 movie The Spirit, based off of the Spirit comic book series by Will Eisner. Since that movie was received so abysmally, it naturally never got a sequel. So this universe having a third Spirit movie in theaters means that Kick-Ass truly lives in a cursed timeline. Actually, fun fact, it was actually Matthew Vaughn's original intent to have Spider-Man 10 on that marquee instead of the Spirit 3. But Sony was not jazzed about that joke in that movie at all, so they decided against it. And as the boys walk away from the theater, Dave's narration says that it doesn't take a trauma, cosmic rays, or a power ring to make a superhero, referencing the superheroes Batman, the Fantastic Four, and Green Lantern respectively. This is followed by Dave receiving his scuba package at home, with the package revealing that Dave resides at 32 West Side Street in New York City, a street that looks a lot like the street that Peter Parker lived on in Sam Raimi's Spider-Man movies. And when Dave puts on his suit for the first time, he looks in the mirror and tells himself that you are fucking awesome, which is exactly what comic book Dave says in the mirror in issue one of Mark Millar's comic as well. And to the right of Dave's mirror, we can see a purple and pink bullseye with an arrow something that I feel could be a nod towards the Marvel hero Hawkeye, as his symbol tends to look a lot like this. And then right after this, the Battle Hymn of the Republic plays in the background when we are finally introduced to the characters Damon and Mindy McCready, played by Nicolas Cage and a 12-year-old Chloe Grace Moretz. The Battle Hymn of the Republic would symbolically play again at the very end of the movie when Kick-Ass arrives to D'Amico's tower with the jetpack machine gun that Big Daddy would buy to please his daughter. The scene of Damon preparing his daughter for the impact of a bullet was pulled straight out of Kick-Ass issue number 6. But instead of calling Mindy his baby doll like he does in the movie, Comic Damon calls Mindy his sugar plum before shooting her. Then, after Damon takes his daughter out for bowling, Mindy jokes with her dad that she wants a puppy as well as a Bratz movie star makeover Sasha, a doll that looks a lot like this. Shout out to Mindy for picking the black doll, y'all! Then, in the next scene, we see Dave drawing his new persona in his notebook while trying to figure out names for himself experimenting with Bad Knight, Badass, before settling on Kick-Ass. Comic Book Dave would also have Bad Knight on his own superhero name brainstorm list alongside Nasty Ass and Nightwalker. Why would you choose Nasty Ass as your name when you're wearing a green suit? That just sounds like diarrhea, Kick-Ass. What are you doing? Nasty Ass. What the fuck is wrong with you, boy? 
However, in the comics, Kick-Ass would not get his name until he is given the name by a nearby pedestrian who would upload footage of Kick-Ass defending one guy by a bunch of goons at the beginning of the third issue, something that of course happens a little bit later in the movie. Then when Kick-Ass begins his training, he tries to jump in between buildings like Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man, but he would end up chickening out when he realizes that he in fact does not have enhanced super jumping powers like Spidey do. But unfortunately, Dave would still end his day in tremendous pain when he is stabbed by his favorite muggers while trying to stand up to them in his superhero suit, only to be immediately run over by a car being driven by some asshole who hits and runs. Then after this, we see Frank's close confidant, Joe, while they're having breakfast on September 28th, 2008. And the reason why I know it's that date exactly is because Frank D'Amico is reading a real article from the New York Post dated as such, with the front page celebrating a New York Mets victory, as well as honoring the passing of actor and director Paul Newman. When Joe and Frank enter Frank's office after this to talk about the unreliable reports from their Russian mole, you can see two large posters of guns on the wall. This is actually a famous piece of art fittingly called Gun by the renowned Andy Warhol in 1981. Then the movie brilliantly transitions from Frank D'Amico's face to Damon McCready drawing Frank D'Amico's face at his extremely unsafe safe house with guns lining the walls. Like, it's so crazy how Damon McCready has used his skills as a talented artist to craft Mindy's role as Hit Girl into a light-hearted and fun game of revenge for her mother by creating a comic book to show his daughter the origins of her current circumstances. In this kick-ass movie, we learn that Damon is actually a former New York City cop that was framed by Frank D'Amico and sent to prison for a long time as a result of D'Amico's dark influence, leading Damon's pregnant wife to overdosing on some pills and dying, forcing Minnie to be extracted from her mother's corpse right after her death. It's a slight variation of the comic book origins of the Marvel character, The Punisher. In the comics, however, Damon McCready is a lot different. Not only is his Big Daddy costume completely different in the comics compared to how Matthew Vaughn would use Batman influences for the film, but Damon McCready himself was a huge fraud of a father, actually being some random guy who was having a midlife crisis who would end up kidnapping his ex-wife's daughter Mindy in order to pretend to be superheroes with her like Batman and Robin with Comic Damon feeding Mindy the completely bogus story that he was framed by the Genovese family in order to give Mindy and him an arch nemesis to focus on. Basically, Comic Book Big Daddy was just as deranged as Kick-Ass was. But that route was a little bit too much for Matthew Vaughn, who felt like that revelation in the original comic made Damon extremely unlikable. So he decided to make that pretend background story Damon's actual background story in this movie. And later on in the movie, when Marcus finds Damon's safe house and goes through that comic book story that Damon made for Mindy, the animated sequence that were shown was actually drawn by kick-ass comic artist and co-creator John Romita Jr., which I thought was a really great touch. And the end of Damon's comic actually ends with a full page drawing of Big Daddy and Hit Girl, a clear tribute to the very last page of Kick-Ass number four. Then a little bit after this, right after we see Frank's men cook their Russian informant alive like a hungry man dinner, we watch Dave look over an x-ray of all of the metal plates he got inserted into his body following his stabbing and car accident, comparing those x-ray images to Wolverine's x-ray from the first X-Men film. Then in the following scene when Dave catches up with his friends at lunch, Todd calls Dave Jason Bourne from the Bourne Identity and its sequels for having desensitized nerve endings, which allowed Dave to take more of a beating without experiencing pain. And right after this, Dave's crush, Katie Duma, asks Dave to hang out at Atomic Comics, something that surprises Dave until his friends explain to him the rumor going around that he's actually gay. A rumor that was inspired by other rumors of Dave being completely naked when he was found by the paramedics. Something that doesn't actually happen in the movie, of course, as Dave would beg a medic to not say anything about the green costume that they found him in. In the comics, though, after Dave gets run over by two girls not paying attention on the road, Dave manages to take all of his clothes off before the paramedics arrive, leaving him naked on the street. But anyways, not long after this, we see Kick-Ass posing in front of his bedroom mirror once again, trying to practice his intimidation tactics, even referencing Robert De Niro's Are You Talking to Me from Taxi Cab when Dave says, Are You Looking at Me? 
Then right after this, we see Kick-Ass 2.0 on patrol looking for a cat named Mr. Bitey when he comes across a gang of bad guys beating up on one dude, causing Kick-Ass to leap into action in comics accurate fashion, refusing to leave the victim's side no matter how many times those dudes beat the shit out of him. Nearby pedestrians of course witness Kick-Ass being heroic after a teen runs into a nearby establishment to gather everyone he can find to watch a superhero in action, you know, rather than calling the cops. With that pedestrian exclaiming, it's fucking awesome, just like that dude did in issue 2 of the comics. And also like the comics, as those assailants run away from Kick-Ass, the dude that Kick-Ass saves thanks him as he stands over his defenseless body before Kick-Ass is elevated into a local hero overnight. As Dave's friends watch the footage of Kick-Ass kicking ass on YouTube.com, a poster featuring Alex Ross's artwork on 2008's Avengers Invaders No. 1 can be seen on a wall next to a poster for the 2007 comic The Incredible Change Bots by Jeffrey Brown, a comic meant to parody the morphing robot genre with Transformers and GoBots being Jeffrey Brown's main inspirations. As Kick-Ass's popularity begins to ramp up, Kick-Ass even gets a shout out from former Late Late Show host Craig Ferguson. While we learn in issue 3 of the comic book that Kick-Ass would actually get late night shout outs from the likes of Jay Leno and David Letterman. A little later, Dave would then go on a gay bestie date with Katie at an Atomic Comics themed after Kick-Ass himself. And while the two are sitting, Katie says that she started reading comics like Brian Lee O'Malley's Scott Pilgrim as well as the Japanese manga Shoujo Beat, before telling Dave that some asshole named Razul was giving her problems, causing Kick-Ass himself to show up at Razul's place in the following scene. Dave is called the green condom by Razul's guard at the door before telling Dave that Halloween isn't for a few months. However, that New York Post newspaper from September 2008 actually proves that Halloween was only a few short weeks away. But that line was put in there as a reference to Eddie Lomas's big black doorman from the comics who would say the same thing. And Razul is of course a film adaptation of the Eddie Lomas character from the comic. And when Kick-Ass approaches Razul, we can see that he's in the middle of playing Call of Duty Modern Warfare on split screen. Whereas in issue 3 of the Kick-Ass comic, Eddie is actually playing Spyro the Dragon. Then a woman in a red dress sarcastically tells Kick-Ass that she's actually Razul and that Kick-Ass should be able to tell because of her big bazongos. A line that is also straight from the comics as well. Hit Girl then makes her very first appearance in the movie by stabbing Razul in the chest with a machete just like her comic book counterpart would do at the very end of issue 3. Hit Girl's first words in the movie also echoes comic book Hit Girl's when she says, Alright you C words, let's see what you can do. And fun fact about that moment, it was actually Chloe Grace Moretz's mother that recommended that Hit Girl drop the comic book accurate C-bomb when Matthew Vaughn was struggling a bit to nail Hit Girl's entrance. And so Matthew Vaughn did. Then the Tra-La-La song by the Dickies plays as Hit Girl proceeds to chop the arms and legs off of all of Razul's men before executing the woman in the red dress through the front door with her swords, just like she does in issue 4, sending that woman to the great strip club in the sky. Then Hit Girl would direct Kick-Ass to the rooftops where Big Daddy high-fives his daughter on a job well done in front of a giant billboard of a woman named Claudia, with that woman actually being Matthew Vaughn's wife Claudia Schiffer, which is a very nice thing for a director to do for his boo. Swing. Swing. And not long after this, Big Daddy and Hit Girl would find Dave's house, a bedroom meetup that actually would not happen in the comics until Kick-Ass had already met and jumped into a burning building with Red Mist in issue 5. When Big Daddy talks to Kick-Ass for the first time, you can really see how a lot of Nick Cage's performance as Big Daddy was actually inspired by Adam West's Batman, something that director Matthew Vaughn actively encouraged Nicolas Cage to do when Cage started doing Adam West impressions during his costume fitting, a decision that Vaughn made to make Big Daddy distinctly different from Christopher Nolan's Batman with his gravelly voice, as Matthew Vaughn thought that Nolan Batman voice was straight up stupid. Matthew Vaughn actually originally wanted Brad Pitt to play the role of Big Daddy, with Mark Wahlberg and Daniel Craig being backup choices. But as soon as he saw Nick Cage do his thing as the character, Vaughn was extremely confident that Cage was the perfect choice for the role. Also, random fact, but Hit Girl's hair was actually originally going to be pink if Matthew Vaughn got his way, but he was eventually convinced to choose purple by the film's costume designer. And speaking of hair, a major difference between Aaron Taylor Johnson's Kick-Ass and the OG comic book Kick-Ass is that Movie Dave's hair is brown as opposed to blonde in the comic. 
But anyways, at the end of their conversation, Mindy makes a joke about Batman's bat signal when she tells Dave that the mayor's office has a penis signal for calling superheroes. And when Hit Girl leaves through Dave's window, you can actually see a picture of a topless pink-haired model to the left. A possible nod to the comic book character Ramona Flowers from Scott Pilgrim, as that character famously had pink hair with goggles in her first appearance. Then, not long after this, we see Big Daddy and Hit Girl have a bonding moment as they prepare to crush one of Frank D'Amico's goons named Cody, played by actor Dexter Fletcher. You might notice that this isn't the first time Dexter Fletcher has played a character named Cody that was chilling inside of a yellow Range Rover. If you've ever watched Matthew Vaughn's 2005 flick Layer Cake, then you'll know that that movie ends with Fletcher's character Cody inside of a yellow Range Rover. So Matthew Vaughn thought it would be funny to have Fletcher be crushed inside of a yellow Range Rover in Kick-Ass as a nod to Fletcher's character from Layer Cake, which is hilarious. Big Daddy and Hit Girl also share this moment in issue 4 of the comics, with Hit Girl also calling Cody a douche after his death. Then after this we see a not gay at all Dave about to platonically rub some lotion on a topless Katie when Katie mentions that she started reading Spider-Man comics drawn by iconic artist Steve Ditko, who famously co-created Spider-Man along with Stan Lee. But hey, speaking of Stan Lee, Lee originally had a cameo filmed at one point during this movie, with Lee being spotted as one of the many people watching the news. However, Lee's cameo would unfortunately be cut from the movie. But while we're talking about comic book creators, after Chris convinces his dad to become the hero Red Mist in order to capture Kick-Ass for murdering his men, he also convinces his dad to screw over a man named Tony Romita, with Romita being a reference to Kick-Ass co-creator John Romita Jr. And with Red Mist starting to become more popular than Kick-Ass, Dave gets super jealous in his bedroom, even trying on a cape to look more like Red Mist, while This Town Ain't Big Enough for the Both of Us by Sparks symbolically plays in the background. However, after Kick-Ass responds to Red Miss MySpace message offering to team up, he was soon be jammed to crazy by Gnarls Barkley inside of a very comics accurate Mistmobile as they ride through the city as new besties with the song ending with the words, I think you're crazy just like me in symbolic connection to their new friendship. A friendship that was unfortunately not real at all. Matthew Vaughn actually ended up keeping the Mistmobile after the movie wrapped but he actually would end up not using the Mistmobile at all due to that car having way too much power to drive. However, just like in Kick-Ass number 5, their joyride would be interrupted by a surprise fire. The fire in the comic was actually a random apartment fire that would almost kill Kick-Ass and Red Mist. However, this time around in the movie, the fire is of course started by Big Daddy after he assaults Frank's lumber warehouse. And after fruitlessly jumping into danger to try to save some of his father's men, Chris would grab the nanny cam teddy bear that he hid in the warehouse in order to film Kick-Ass's unmasking. And when Chris would plug in that teddy bear to watch the footage with his father, you can actually see how Frank D'Amico truly was using that nanny cam in the past to spy on Chris's old babysitter while she was in the bathroom like a creep because that footage is still in the teddy bear. The insanity from the fire naturally causes Dave to freak out and make him want to give up being kick-ass for good, but not before showing up to Katie's house and confessing that he's not gay and that he's been kick-ass the entire time. Something that angers Katie at first, but then she quickly forgives him and the two become a couple that be banging on the regs. A fate that comic book kick-ass wishes happened to him because at the end of that comic book series, Katie straight up says F you to Dave for manipulating her with lies before adding salt to that wound by sending Dave videos of her sucking some other guy's sausage. Which is super rude and messed up. But what's even more messed up is that Dave actually uh, J.O.'d to those videos while crying so yeah comic book dave is kind of a kind of a sad man <laughs> however before kick-ass can officially retire he answers a panicked call from red mist saying that both red mist and kick-ass have a price on their heads before being convinced by red mist to meet up with big daddy and hit girl at their secret base and while big daddy gets ready for their meeting we can see how much his superhero disguise involves him extending his mustache with fake hair an idea that actor Nick Cage actually pitched to Matthew Vaughn himself. And unfortunately, pretty much as soon as Kick-Ass and Red Mist arrive at that safe house, Red Mist whips out his gun and shoots a little girl in the chest like a little bitch before D'Amico's goons come in and grab Big Daddy and Kick-Ass. 
in Kick-Ass number seven, it's actually Chris's father that shoots Hit Girl out of the window in a hailstorm of bullets, but they would change it to Chris for the movie. This of course leads to that live stream of Kick-Ass and Big Daddy getting beaten ruthlessly by D'Amico's masked men in front of the world. With one of those masked men even wearing a red mask with a yellow thunderbolt on it like the Flash to mock the two heroes. This beating is actually a much better punishment than what Kick-Ass from the comics got, as that Kick-Ass would be tortured by having his balls strapped to a car battery and zapped repeatedly which is literally how the first issue starts in the comics. But luckily for both versions of Kick-Ass, here comes Hit-Girl to save the day. After Hit-Girl takes out the lights and activates her night vision mode, we can see her holding a gun and knife in a similar way to how it's seen in Modern Warfare 2, specifically when a player has the tactical knife attachment equipped. Vaughn being inspired by Modern Warfare 2 seems highly likely considering that the game came out a year before this movie's release, and we did also see Razul and his boys playing Modern Warfare earlier in the movie and us seeing Hit-Girl in the first person mode as she assassinates all those assholes shows us how Hit-Girl literally sees her entire life as a game, just like her father intended. However, during Hit-Girl's assault, Big Daddy begins to burn alive, but despite this, her father attempts to help his daughter out by calling out special code names for tactics that they practice in the past. When Big Daddy tells Hit-Girl to switch to Kryptonite, she uses the strobe of her gun to weaken the eyesight of her attackers with Kryptonite of course being a reference to Superman's green crystal of a weakness in the comics. He would then instruct Minnie to enact Robin's Revenge, which to me feels like a reference to World's Finest issue number 184 from 1969 DC Comics, an issue titled Robin's Revenge. And during that issue, not only would Robin be pushed to the edge following what he believes is the death of his mentor Batman, but we would also see Superman get temporarily blinded by light by a mysterious villain named Golden Gloves. So likely as a reference to that moment in the comic, Big Daddy ordering Mindy to go to Robin's revenge was a clue for Mindy to blind the rest of D'Amico's men with her kryptonite strobe light so that she could enact her own revenge for her father like Robin was going to for Batman in that issue. Then Hit Girl would truly get her revenge when she would arrive at D'Amico's tower, armed to the teeth, to exterminate all of D'Amico's men one by one as Joan Jett's rendition of Bad Reputation plays in the background. In Kick-Ass number 8, Hit-Girl and Kick-Ass actually take the elevator ride up to the tower together, with Hit-Girl unleashing a flamethrower onto the squad of goons as soon as that elevator door opens. And a little later, I love how when Stu is about to shoot a bazooka at a preteen girl next to a bunch of armed men for backup, a poster behind them with the words Brave Men on it can be seen, a subtle joke that the movie has made to mock the men's cowardice towards Hit-Girl. But Stu would not get a chance to blow up Hit-Girl, as Kick-Ass would of course show up with a machine gun jetpack to mow Stu and his boys down to an Elvis Presley rendition of the Battle Hymn of the Republic, leading Kick-Ass and Hit-Girl to finally face off against the D'Amico's, with Kick-Ass knocking Chris out before going to help Mindy by shooting Frank with Big Daddy's stolen bazooka. In Kick-Ass number 8, Kick-Ass actually saves Mindy by shooting John Genovese in the nuts, giving Mindy the chance to chop a knife directly in the mob boss's head. But anyways, as the movie wraps up and Dave and Marty are kissing their respective girlfriends at Atomic Comics, issues of Mark Millar's Kick-Ass can be seen in dollar bins before Todd picks up and reads himself Kick-Ass number 1. Then, at the very end of the movie, Red Miss goes from fake aspiring hero to full-on villain when he becomes Kick-Ass's future arch-nemesis, the motherfucker with Chris wearing an orange-themed suit to honor his father who loved wearing orange himself. And during this final moment, Chris would quote the iconic Joker line from Batman 89 when he says, wait till you get a load of me, making Jack Nicholson undoubtedly proud as hell. And before Chris would shoot the screen to end the movie, you can actually see that Chris was reading some comic books on his desk earlier that day with Marvel's The Ultimates and Ultimate X-Men being among those books. And fun fact about the credits, but if you look at the cast list, you can see that Matthew Vaughn hilariously named a number of goons in this movie after the Spice Girls, as you can see a sporty goon, a scary goon, a baby goon, ginger goon, and a posh goon. All hail the Spice Goons, my fellow gooners. And I know that there are some gooners out there, I see you. We be goonin' not concerning what nobody's gotta say. But anyways, that is it for this breakdown of the first Kick-Ass movie from 2010. What did you guys think of this movie? Do you guys think that this movie is better than the comics? 
because Mark Millar and John Romita Jr. actually do prefer this movie version over the comic book version. But anyways, thank you guys so much for watching this breakdown of Kick-Ass from 2010. What do you guys think of this movie? Let us know in the comment section down below. You already know the deal. And if you guys want to see more of what I have to say, you can follow me at Mastertainment on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, wherever I am on the internet. But most importantly, follow Heavy Spoilers here on YouTube. And when you do, make sure you hit the notification bell to get notifications for every time we upload a video. But yes, I love you guys so much. You guys are amazing, like always. And I'll see you guys next time.